Hi, I'm Dan Harris. This time on Beliefs, we're going to meet the happiest man alive. That's what he's been labeled. He is a Buddhist monk who's had his brain studied by neuroscientists. Also, we're going to sit down with the prominent atheist Sam Harris, who's out with a controversial new book arguing that science, not religion, should be the basis for modern morality. But first, Mathieu Ricard, the Buddhist monk who's been called the happiest man alive. You have this unofficial title of happiest man on earth. <laughs> what to do? I tried so many disclaimers, you know. Where did this come from? Well, it's funny. There was a, a ABC Australia uh, documentary on happiness and then other emotions like anger and so forth. So they came to Kathmandu to visit at my hermitage. We went together to the neuroscience lab in Madison. And, you know, at those days was the first time when I was participating in those neuroscience research. And they had found that uh, myself and other meditators later on, when we engage in unconditional compassion or unconditional love meditation, there is an activation of certain brain waves in certain areas of the prefrontal cortex. So I, there's no scientific ground for that. It's just one study that is interesting, of course. But, you know, how can you compare with six billion human beings? <laughs> and also it doesn't really measure happiness. Of course, altruistic love is one of the most constructive, positive mental state of all. Because selfishness is one of the most miserable of all. But then to jump from that to the happiest person in the world, so I apologize to my scientist friend, but I can't get rid of that. It's better than being labeled the unhappiest person in the world, for sure. Do you, do you ever get into really bad moods? No. No? No, no not bad mood. I mean, there's no reason for it. I mean, I, you, you can get... Uh, no, you can get, have states of mind like indignation, which is not the same as anger. Like, if you're facing a strong injustice, not for you, but in general for someone else, or, or a face of a massacre, of a real injustice, there's a kind of you know, bright state of mind. They say, this cannot be, and I'm ready to do anything we can to remedy to that. But it's still wholesome. What will really be upsetting and... Uh, and undermined happiness is unwholesome state of mind, hatred, jealousy, arrogance. So those, or despair, those really are, go totally against the very root of, of well-being and fulfillment. So you have <clears throat> launched this very public campaign to get people to meditate. I feel like most people, when they hear the word meditation, they, they picture somebody sitting cross-legged with incense burning yeah. and um, yeah, I know. spacing out, and yeah, it yeah, seems right. like a really under hard... Under a mango tree. And... Yes, under a mango tree, and it seems really hard and maybe very, very annoying. Well, every, you know, we, there's a saying in Tibetan, in the beginning nothing comes. So it is the hard part. You, know, you try, and then it seems you're not making progress. In the middle, nothing stays. I mean, you may have achieved something for a while, then, oh, it's gone again. And in the end, nothing goes. That means it's like every skill. You know, in the beginning, it's contrived. It's not necessarily pleasant. But in the end, you start to become more familiar with it. And then in the end, it's, it's, very, it's not a second nature, but your true nature. It's the opposite, let's say, with just worldly, ordinary pleasures. In the beginning, it's very enticing. It looks fantastic. The more you go, the more you get tired of it. So I would say meditation is the opposite. So a way of being is something different. Instead of depending on the outer circumstances and being vulnerable to the ups and downs of the outer world, it gives you the resources to deal with those ups and downs. So that whether in pleasant or unpleasant circumstances, you maintain the same openness, the same resilience, the same, you know, basically, you are not that vulnerable. It doesn't mean you are indifferent, but you're much less affected. But, but that does sound a little bit like indifference. Well, the difference is that indifference with the I don't care. Now here, by not being swayed by the little ups and downs, by reacting very strongly with likes and dislikes, craving and hatred, the freedom gives you the possibility actually to engage in a much more realistic way. You know, it gives you a very, uh, very wonderful inner resources to deal with all that in a constructive way. Why not losing your inner peace and achieving constructive things for yourself and for others? There will be people who hear this and say, 
my pain, my suffering, my shortcomings are a part of who I am. And in fact, if I'm an artist, I, you know, I, I use this to create. Yeah, well, that's, I, I hear that a lot. First of all, I, I was struck by that because I heard that so many times. You know, great artists are only people who are a little bit uh, upset and depressed and they have to, the creativity come from there. Right, if, if Van Gogh hadn't been Why? so crazy that he didn't okay. chop no, his ear I studied up. that because yeah. I, I was puzzled by that. Okay. It turns out that those cases are really, you know, uh, exemplified very often. But if you look in the, there, was, there had been a study on creativity and it turns out that vast majority of artists were just, you know, just nice, normal people with not too much inner, you know, being torn apart and cutting their hairs and stuff like that. But, you know, those exceptional cases attract our attention and imagination. And it, even the artists who had cyclic depression, the study showed that actually their best production was when they were out of that. So I don't think it's, 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 a, it's a cliche to say that you need to be totally upset and with the world in order to create something. I, mean, I don't think it's, it's true. Give me the basics. If I want to start meditating, what do I do? So for that, we need to start with basic uh, techniques of simple concentration. So for that, usually we need to assume a proper physical posture, not just like sitting like a, you know, like a yogi with full, you know, cross leg and, but, you know, not also too much like if you sit like that, you know, you fall asleep basically. Or people say, I'm meditating lying down, you can take a good nap. <laughs> so a balanced posture somehow brings a, a sort of clear, balanced mind. So if you can't sit cross-legged, otherwise sit on a chair, but with some kind of spine straight. And so you don't have to sit cross-legged on the ground. If you can, but if you physically, it's more, it more painful than anything else, and you will meditate on pain all the time on your knees, so what's the point? But the main thing is the mind, of course. So <clears throat> how to have the mind to be more focused? You need an object. So it could be an auto object, you know, an image, of, but something very subtle like the feeling of the breath coming out from through your nostril, there's a small sensation here or sensation in the abdomen. It's very subtle that if you are focused, you'll be there. If your mind is distracted, you lose it completely. So now, this is the crucial point. You should not say, oh, I can't meditate. You know, this is useless. The moment you realize that you have been distracted, that means your mindfulness has come back. So don't add to it by regret, by just, okay, I'm coming back to the mindfulness. And you continue. Our thanks to Mathieu Ricard. Up next, Sam Harris.